All right, so what I like to do is have my Rhino um, application um, kind of docked over here on the left, Grasshopper here on the right, so we can start to build out our first file. All right, and uh, a quick note on the files. Um, you should have received a link to a zip file that you can download that will have all of the files that we'll be going over today as referenced before we do them together. All right, so they're ordered um, incrementally and they will um, and we'll be going over each one. Uh, so if you want to, you could open up the first one, but we're going to be building that up from scratch uh, together. All right, and we really want to make this uh, as live as a, of experience, learning experience as we can for you. Okay, so um, this is really going to be about the basics of data trees. Um, so what we're going to do is we want to work with um, creating a grid of points. Okay, so let's first find our point object under the vector tab. I'm going to go to point, point X, Y, Z. Okay, so we know that if we just put this uh, point X, Y, Z um, object into the grasshopper canvas, uh, we um, will see a point here in the um, in the Rhino viewport. Right by default, it's got values in the x, y, and uh, z uh, coordinates uh, stored inside of these inputs. All right, and um, so if we wanted to change the values here, right, we could go ahead and give ourselves um, a slider, right, um, that would allow us to dynamically update the position of this point. But uh, that's great, and if uh, we see the output of our point here, we see we have one locally defined value, that's 0, 0, 0, that makes sense. Um, that's our point coordinate. Um, but what if we wanted to create multiple points, right? Instead of supplying a single value for x or y, we need to supply multiple values. So the first thing that we, we want to do is um, start to look at the uh, ways to create a list of values. So if we pop over to the Sets tab, under Sequence, let's go to Series, right? And Series is um, just a way to create a series of numbers, right? Starting at a certain value, incrementing, incrementing by a certain value, and up until we have this many uh, values created, right? So let's go ahead and um, create a slider so that we can um, uh, manipulate how many values we'll, we'll have. So I'm going to do a shortcut for that, double click. I'm going to say that I want a slider between 1 and then say less than 10, less than 25, right? And this is my shortcut for saying that I want an integer slider that starts at 1, its current value is 10, and its maximum value is 25. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hook that up to C, and I'm going to use a panel from params input to see what we get as a result, right? Now we have 10 or however many values that we've asked for created from our series, right? So if we go ahead and connect that to X of our point input, right now we have a row of points. And coming out of our point object, we have just a single list. All right, so as we move our slider, our list grows or gets smaller based on this uh, number inside of the slider. Okay, now our stated objective here is that we want to create a grid of points, right? So how can we get a grid of points where we're defining exactly where those x and y coordinates, is, coordinates are? Um, so I'm going to copy and paste the series, and if I connect this up to y, let's see what we get. All right, now I don't have a grid of points yet. Um, does anyone want to take a guess at why, uh, we, why the points are visualized in this manner as opposed to being in a grid? If you have a suggestion, go ahead and drop it into the questions window, and, um, and we'll take a look at what some of the suggestions are. And that's right, you've got it, because it is the longest list algorithm based on the data matching that we were sp speaking about before. By default, all the objects in Grasshopper have the longest list data matching algorithm assigned to them. So inside of the right-click menu, if you were to right-click on this object, you would see that um, 
or in a previous versions, you would see, you used to be able to see if it was a longest list or shortest list assignment. All of that's now stored under the sets list um, tab down here at the bottom portion, right? So shortest, longest, and cross-reference. So if I wanted to create all of the points, right, within the grid, that is four by eight, four points by eight points, which one of these uh, list options would I use? Would I use shortest, longest, or cross-reference? Go ahead and um, drop a suggestion into the questions window if you, ha if you have an idea about which one we would want to use. Again, the idea is that we want to create the entire grid. And there are some suggestions for cross-reference, so let's go ahead and give that a shot, right? We want to connect our series into A and the other series into B and then use the output of A and B to get our grid. Now, this is great. We have the points that we want. But the challenge is, how are they organized now? What if we want to do something within these points? What if we wanted to draw a line that goes vertically through this collection of points and this one, etc.? Well, the output of this um, parametric definition at this point just gives us a single list. And this is, a, this is now a challenge, right? Because they're all on one list, and we have to somehow go through and sort them. OK, so data trees um, give us an alternative to that, right? So I'm going to delete my cross-reference here. And um, let's look at an alternative option, right? And this is going to be having to do with moving from lists to data trees based on the, the specific condition that we're working within, right? Um, and this is going to be moving from uh, a simple data tree to one where we graft a list, sorry, moving from a simple list to one in which we have a data tree. And so we're going to be grafting our list of data so that we now have a new branch at every item. So the diagram of that action would look something like this. If we have a, a list, let's say a list of four, every time we graft, that list of four grows so that now each one of those elements on that list are on their own list and our data structure has grown one level. Right? If we've gone from level B to level C, right? we did have A, B before and now we have A, B, C based on the branch level. Right? Now if we do that within um, our file as we've develop it, developed it thus far, we're going to be able to um, uh, match things in a grafted list back to a regular list. So let's go ahead and do that. If we um, let's graph the top one. Uh, so to do so, I'm going to use the graft object, which is under sets tree, graft, and we'll drop our first series in uh, to the graft. Connect that to X. Notice my fancy wires are now uh, dashed and thick, as opposed to just uh, a double line. Right, so they're double lined, but they're also dashed. So now, instead of just a single list of uh, points, we now have it organized in a particular way. It is in either rows or columns, depending on which one of these series we graphed before we go into the XYZ object. So let's visualize what that means um, within the Rhino viewport. So let's go to the vector tab under point. Let's use point list, and this will tell us the order of all the elements in the list, and they have to be points. All right, so if I zoom in here, right, I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in this way, I have a grid that's 8 by 6, so 8 in the x direction, 6 in the y direction, and my um, points are being organized in columns. Now, if I were to swap which one of these gets grafted, right, and say that the second series, which is going into Y, is now the grafted element, I will now have rows, right? So again, um, by keeping our, um, our data organized, first within a list and then within a tree, uh, by just simply changing which of the two inputs is grafted will give us the ability to change the kind of direction of the data, right? What is it storing? Is it storing something that makes sense as a row or as a column? All right, so if you wanted to uh, 
uh, add some more functionality to this file to see the index values a little bit bigger, you can just grab a slider and connect that into the S input of our point display, and now you'll see them a little bit bigger. All right. Um, lastly, while we're here, uh, we want to um, take a look at the um, data structure as created with our uh, friend, the Param Viewer, right? So our panel is the way for us to see what is actually inside each list or element. Is it a point, a line, etc.? And the Param Viewer, which is located under Param's utility Param Viewer, this is the way to not understand what's, what data is there, but how is that data organized. So this tells us that we have data with six branches, each of which has eight elements. Each branch, which is defined by this path, it has eight elements on it. Right? If we double click this, um, we have now a graphical representation of this data structure. Right, where we have levels A, B, and C that correspond to A, B, and C, where we can see where in the where in the structure of the data are we moving from just a single list to a new um, a new data structure element here, right? Where we grow the path to a new level, right? And anywhere it splits, we're moving from a list of elements into individual elements. Okay, so let's look at one other object that can um, help us gather a little bit more information about our tree, and that's going to be the tree statistics, right? And this is a, a relatively new object within Grasshopper, and this uh, gives us all the information concerning the data tree um, in a simple object that uh, provides the output of both uh, the paths of the tree, the length of each branch in the tree, and the number of paths in the tree. All right, so if we look at the, under the sets tab, under tree, we have here the tree statistics. So any data tree that we have going in here, uh, we can now gather what all the paths are. So if I bring another panel down here, these are the paths as strings. Right? These are the characters that represent those paths. We have also the length of each path stored in a list and the number of or the count of how many paths we have. And this is a really useful new object. We're going to be using this extensively today. Again, this is tree statistics. Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about um, the kind of basics of data trees, the taxonomy of data trees, and where the opportunity lies in using data trees as a hierarchical uh, organizing device within Grasshopper. But let's talk about also what we're not going to do today, right? The art of manipulating data trees includes not ever using the following objects. And really, again, we're talking about how you can have a very precise and uh, robust means of working with data trees within Grasshopper, not one that uh, relies upon um, very long-handed um, techniques or anything like that, but very directly and specifically working with data trees, such that we all become maestros in our own right. So what are we not going to do? Uh, we're not going to flatten. Right? We're never going to flatten our data tree. Hopefully after this course, you won't ever feel that you have to flatten. Right? Uh, flatten is bad because it removes all of the elements and uh, organization of a data tree and brings everything back down to a single list, right? We don't want to do that. We want to take advantage of the different objects that allow us to work with data trees and not ever take all of that information that we've built up away, right? So if we had a data tree such as this, which has just a couple of levels to it, and we're storing things at the end of each branch, right? In this case, this diagram is showing that we have different numbers of elements at the end of each branch. But if we flatten it, what was uh, very organized and hierarchical, where we have 0, 0, 0, 1, this collection of paths, becomes just this. There's nothing left to it. Everything gets collapsed into one list. And we now have uh, just a single index or path that is describing everything. Okay, and we don't want to do that because we want to keep all the information that we build up. Um, 
within our data tree. Right? The other thing that we're not going to do, although this is less of a kind of um, a negative when we're uh, artfully working with data trees, uh, we're not going to use the path mapper. Right? Uh, we covered this element in the working with data trees course. Um, but the path mapper, which allows us to perform lexical operations on data trees, um, it's not bad in and of itself, uh, but it is a challenge um, to keeping your file uh, robust and um, kind of dynamic, even if you change some of the things that happen upstream within your logic, right? Um, if we do something within the context of a lexical mapper where we're, let's say, uh, swapping out one of the index values within each path for another value, right? That's not um, that's great and it's pow a powerful tool. Um, but what it's going to do is, um, by performing that lexical operation, if we do anything back here, this is going to break, right? So we're going to not do that today, so that we can look at ways that we can make it dynamic. And if you've spent uh, any time working on a project or developing a sketch in, in any depth you'll and you've used the lexical mapper if you ever find that the base parameters or logic might change and you have to make any updates back here you'll have seen this thing turn orange or red and then you have to go back in and manually change it and we don't want to do that we want to have everything be dynamic and and flow in terms of um, kind of smoothly in terms of our creative process